Well, hey, everybody, good morning to you. Happy Sunday to you. I'm really glad you're here today. Uh, if you got a Bible, I'd love for you to uh, get to the book of Joshua in that Bible, the sixth book of the Bible. This is a real important deal that we're going to talk about today at this particular time in the life of our church and I think in your life too. But the book of Joshua, it's at the end of what's known as the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible. And what's happening at the end of the Pentateuch is it's moving on to the next section in the history of God's people. Uh, It's uh, about a new generation of people that God's going to work with as the ones who would enter into what's called the promised land. Uh, Some of you might remember that there was a generation that was led out of slavery in Egypt. They left slavery in Egypt, and all of them refused to trust God, except for three of them, Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. Outside of them, the rest of them refused to trust God. God and take the step that he wanted them to take. And because they didn't trust God or believe him and believe that he was sufficient, uh, they all died off. It was about a 40-year period, and they all died. And so there's this next generation that God is going to work with to establish a people through which he's going to bless the entire world. And with this new generation, God's heart is not that he wants them to suffer for or be punished because of the sins of their parents. It's actually just the opposite. He wants them to go a whole different path. And the old generation's problem was, you know, they just didn't trust God and take the step he wanted them to take. And the way that they expressed it about themselves and their situation back in the book of Numbers, a couple of books before, they said, we're like grasshoppers. God's calling us to do this really big thing, to occupy this new land, this promised land, but we've seen the challenge that's before us, and we can't do it. It's too big of a step, and we don't believe that God is sufficient. We don't trust that God's really going to enable us to do what He's calling us to do, and so they grumbled around, and they lived in fear. And so look carefully here in Joshua 1 at the promise that God makes to this new generation while they're on the banks of the Jordan River across from the city of Jericho. Joshua 1 says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them. I'll give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, so be strong and courageous, because I'll lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. And then he says again, be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified. Don't be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. All right, so that's the promise there. God is saying, hey, don't live in fear. I don't want you to make the same mistake that your parents did. And his promise is, I'm going to be with you. I've already gone ahead of you. My power will be available to you. You are not going to undertake this challenge uh, on your own. You're you're not going to live the rest of your life on your own power, just with your own resources. And I want us to see a wonderful way that God underscores this. Verses 10 and 11, he says, So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, Go through the camp and tell the people, Get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. I want, and I want you to make note of that phrase there, three days from now. You may want to underline that or highlight that in your Bible there, because there's a pattern that runs all throughout the Bible. Like very often in the Old Testament, people are told that they're going to have to wait a little while for, uh, for deliverance or for rescue for God's power to be shown in their lives. And the waiting period is generally three days. It's this time of anticipation. For instance, some of you will remember back in June when we talked about Joseph's life, if you were here, and some of you will remember in Genesis 50, the first book of the Bible, Joseph says to the cupbearer when he's still in prison, he says, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your job. Or in Exodus 3.18, Moses asked Pharaoh, let us go three days into the wilderness. And you may wonder, like, what's with the three days? What's up with the three days, Dave? 
Well, it gets cleared up in Exodus 19 when God says in verse 11 of Exodus 19, consecrate the people, make them ready by the third day because on the third day the Lord will come down. Three days is a special, special day. You know, Esther, some of you know about her in the Bible. Before she risks her life to confront the king, she says that she will fast for guess how many days? Three days. Then she'll go to the king and seek deliverance for her people. Jonah is swallowed by a large fish. He's in the belly of a fish for how many days? Three days before he's released. And Jonah's hoping he goes out the same way he comes in. Like the third day is used so frequently this way in the Bible that it's a technical expression, meaning the short time that people have to wait for deliverance because the third day is when God is going to show up. We see this beautifully expressed in the book of Hosea in the Bible, Hosea 6.2. It says, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us. And of course, all this is, is just kind of setting up the ultimate third day where the Apostle Paul, he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, for that which was of first importance have passed on to you, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised when? On the third day. On the third day. There's a band that's been around for a while now, and they actually take their name from this very verse, 1 Corinthians 15. You know what their name is? Third day, because the third day is God's day. The third day is when prisoners get set free and mountains shake and rivers get parted. The third day is the day when young girls face down kings and prophets get dropped off at seaside ports by giant fish. It's the day stones get rolled away and the Son of God comes back to life. And from that day on to this one, his followers, those of us who call ourselves Christians, his followers who used to observe the Sabbath, now observe instead on Sundays what the Bible says through Apostle John in the very last book of the Bible in Revelation 1.10, what John calls the Lord's Day, because we're third-day people now. You and I are third-day people. We're betting everything on the third day. We're betting the farm on the third day. You never know what God's going to do on the third day. Well, in chapter 3 of Joshua, the third day comes, and God's going to do something remarkable on that day, but here's what we need to see. On the third day, there's something God's people have to do first. In Joshua 3, God gives these fairly lengthy instructions to Joshua, and he tells them that the people are to cross over the Jordan, the river there. And the priests are to carry the Ark of the Covenant, and they are to go before the people, a way of symbolizing the fact that they're being guided by God, what's possible for us now because of God's Spirit, His Holy Spirit. But they, the priests are to carry the Ark before the people. And in verse 13, and as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Now, to understand the significance of what's going on here, we got to talk a little bit about the Jordan River. It's a very important river, a very significant river in God's, the life of God's people. As some of you may know, in the ancient world, water was real, real scarce. So a river was highly, highly valued. And in many countries, the primary river was sort of sacred. It was, it was, like, uh, for instance, the Nile was kind of sacred in Egypt, or the Ganges was sacred in India. But the Jordan River, it never was considered that in Israel. The Jordan River was symbolically in Israel kind of a barrier. It's what stood between the people of God who are on one side and the life that God calls them into on the other. It's something they have to get across. And the Jordan River, it starts up in Mount Hermon, and it comes down to the Sea of Galilee, eventually ends up at the Dead Sea. And Mount Hermon, where it starts... Is real high above sea level. It's got an elevation of about 7,000 feet above sea level. It's quite high. The Dead Sea, where it ends up, is the lowest body of water on earth, about 1,300 feet below sea level. So it has to descend a long way, and so the water can flow quite fast, which means that that can make the river quite difficult to get across. Now, archaeologists say there were several places where the Jordan River could be crossed. It could be waded across or forded across. You know, there were no bridges then, but you could ford the river uh, uh, at certain places in the, in the river. But here's where things get a little interesting. Joshua 3.15 says this, now the Jordan is at flood stage. So 
when the people are at the Jordan River right now, it's at flood stage, which means there's no way to get across it. It's too deep. And again, there are no bridges, there are no boats, there are no jet skis. You can't wade across, you can't ford across it. There's no way. They've come all this way. The promised land is right over there, and there's no way to get across the Jordan River. And they wonder, what in the world has Joshua done leading us out here? But God says, I'm going to make a way. I will allow you to cross the Jordan River. I want you to go down. I want the priest to put one foot in the Jordan River, and when you do that, I'm going to make a way. But check this out. During the flood stages of the Jordan, the banks of the river are essentially perpendicular. It's not like when you go to the ocean, you go to Ocean City or something, you know, and you gradually make your way into the water. You stick your toe in, and then you get up to your ankle, and you go up to your knee, you know, and you just gradually step into it there. No. If you're on the banks of the Jordan River at this particular time, when you go into the river, you go into the river, you know. So imagine that you're the first priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and Joshua says, I want you to step into the Jordan River. And if you do that, you're in the river. And if it doesn't part, you're down 20 feet into the river. What options do you have? Not many. Like, I think if I was the lead guy carrying the Ark that day, I'd be tempted to say to the priest behind me, I'd be tempted to say, hey, I think I was in the front yesterday. And everybody knows you can't be in the front two days in a row. So I think you're supposed to come up to the front. And besides, I got a backpack. Everybody knows you can't get in the water with a backpack. You know, so I think you need to come up front, you know. It's a real sobering thing that God asks the people to do. But here's the lesson that's going on. God's teaching his people a huge lesson. It's something they had to get. We got to get it too. The people faced an obstacle. The Jordan is a barrier. They got to get across the Jordan to get to the life that God has for them. And God's power is sufficient. God will deliver them. God will make a way. But they have to take the first step. They would not see God's power. They would not see the incredible display of God's faithfulness and God's sufficiency until they took the first step. God says, I want you to take one step into the Jordan, and then you'll see me at work. He's teaching his people how a relationship with him, how trust with him works. God is teaching his people, I have so much power, and I want to manifest it in your life. I want to display it in your life. But if you want to see my power, you'll have to take the risk, and you'll have to take the step, and you go, you'll have to trust me first. To be in a relationship with me, God is saying, to enter into the life that I'm calling you into, it's going to involve some spiritual risk-taking. It's going to involve a step of obedience. And fortunately, they obey. Unlike the previous generation, they take the step, and God walls up the water, and they cross over. Now, most of the rest of the book of Joshua involves a series of battle stories that are centered around this exact same theme. Will God's people trust God enough to do what he says? Will they trust him enough to take a step? Like Joshua 5 is one example of this. You think about this one. God tells Joshua to have all the men circumcised. All right, they're getting ready to go to war, but the men are to be circumcised first. All right, they're sitting there, they're getting ready to go to war. They're like, okay, God, how are we going to prepare for war? And God says, I want all the men to be circumcised. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> wait, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, did, did you say circumcised? He's like, yep, I want you to all be circumcised. And they're like, hey, wait a minute. What are the other options? Is there like a plan B or something? Shannon gave us options, multiple choice. Can't we have some options? You know? He's like, nope. Nope. Want all the men to be circumcised. Now, let me ask you, if, if you were going to war and you just crossed the Jordan, so there's no escape back if your enemies decide to attack you, is that the moment that you would choose to have your whole army circumcised? No. Not a shot. They're vulnerable. There are no frozen peas in the desert to help them cope with this. <laughs> Like, did I step over a line right there? Did I go over a line? All right. But God, you see, he, he wants to know, do you really trust me? Do you really trust that I'll protect you? Will you obey me? Joshua 6 is the story of the fall of Jericho. It's a rather well-known story. But what's important for us to understand about Jericho, it was the oldest fortified city in Canaan, if not the 
the whole world. But it was also quite small. Archaeologists say that their best estimate was it was about four acres behind double walls. It's quite small. It was only about twice the size of the land that our facility is on. Our facility that we own here with the church is about two acres. It's like twice the size of that. That's it. So it's quite small. And God's people could have overtaken the city by an attack. In a siege or an attack, they would have won. And instead, they get this command from God. God says, hey, in order to take Jericho, I want you to walk around Jericho for seven days. And on the seventh day, I want you to walk around it seven times. It's a walkathon. I mean, the soldiers are going to feel a little silly doing it, you know. But there's a reason for it. Joshua 6, 16 says, so that you will know that the Lord has given you the city. See, this is God's work. God says, will you trust me enough to do something, even if you feel a little foolish doing it, even if nobody else is doing it this way? Like if you were operating in your own strength, you could feel so strong, but will you trust me and do it this way like I'm asking you to do? That same theme runs throughout the entire book. One of the great stories of trust is in the 14th chapter of Joshua, verse 10. This is the story of Caleb. And Joe Wilson talked about Caleb in our summer series back in July, but Caleb's one of the 12 spies. You might remember, again, sent out by Moses to the promised land a long time ago, and only Caleb and Joseph or Joshua trusted God. They're the only ones who said, like, we can do it. God wants us to take this step. We've seen the land. We can do it. But because of Israel's unbelief, Caleb spent 40 years of his life in the wilderness from when he was 40 years old The next four decades, he can't cross the Jordan, not because he lacks faith, but because the people around around him lack faith. And by the time they cross the Jordan, he's 80 years old, and this is five years later. Caleb is 85 years old. Keep that in mind and take a look at chapter 14, verse 10. This is Caleb talking. He says, now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then, which is a pretty amazing thing for an 85-year-old to say. He says, now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out. Just as he said, 85-year-old guy, and he asks for the hill country. That's the hardest kind to take. And he asks to face the Anakites, Israel's most formidable opponents. This guy's 85 years old. And you'd think he'd be asking for a condo in Florida with a pickleball court and a golf league or something. But he asked for a really hard job. He says, give me one more chance to cross the Jordan. One more chance to do a really hard thing for God. One more chance just to trust him. I'm 85 years old, 45 years. I've been waiting for this chance. Don't let me miss it now. What a spirit. What a heart. What an attitude. There's example after example of God asking his people to take a step and trust that he will display his power in their lives. And you can read all about it throughout the book of Joshua. But now I want to get a little personal. I want to ask you, what's your Jordan River? Where's God asking you to take a step of faith? Because here's what I know. Everybody in this room faces the Jordan. Everybody in this room faces barriers that try to prevent us from entering into the life that God has for us, every one of us. And God's promise is, I've gone before you, I'll be there with you, I hope you take the step, but you got to choose. And stepping into the Jordan, whatever your Jordan is, it always involves fear. That's why Joshua 1 says over and over and over again, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Be courageous, don't be afraid. Where are you afraid? One of my favorite stories about fears about this guy, he knew God was calling him to take a step and do something, but it scared him to death. And he took a long walk with his wife, and he was talking about what he knew God wanted him to do that scared him so much. And he said to her, he said, listen, every time I think about doing this, 
my palms get real sweaty. I don't know if you ever had that happen to you before. My palms get sweaty. And then about an hour later, they keep walking, still talking about the same thing. And he says, every time I think about doing this, this step God would want me to take, my mouth gets real dry. And his wife, in a moment of clarity, his wife says, well, why don't you lick your palms? <laughs> real compassionate wife right there. But listen, for some people in this room, at this particular time in your life, at this particular season in your life, it's palm licking time. <laughs> it is. It's time for some spiritual risk taking. It's time to take a step. God's power generally gets released when somebody trusts him enough to obey him generally. And some people spend their whole life standing scared on the banks of the Jordan waiting for the waters to part first. Okay, God, you part the waters first and I'll be the first one in. But you make it a little easier, God, all right? You give me whatever it is I need before I can take that step of faith. Like maybe you're tempted to think, God, give me lots of money, and then I'll be faithful and generous. But for so many people, it's the giving that comes first, and that's when they see God really, really work in their lives and be so faithful in their lives. But we stand by the side of the Jordan River, and we say, God, you make it easy first. You send lots of resources first, and then I'll become a generous person. And if that's you, I think you're going to wait a long time. Maybe you're tempted to think, God, give me lots of confidence, lots of confidence and courage, and then I'll tell somebody else about you. Make it really easy. I, I was thinking about this. There's this risk of evangelism that you and I, like you step into, like a risk that you take in reality. And it's kind of sobering because you look back at what God calls other people to do. God calls Moses. He says, hey, talk to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, I want you to release my people. Let my people go. Worst case scenario, if it went really bad for Moses, what might happen to Moses? He could die. God said to Joshua, I want you to go into the Jordan River. Worst case scenario, it's at flood level. Waters don't part. What could happen to Joshua? He could die. God says to Paul, I want you to proclaim the gospel in the face of Roman persecution in a Roman jail cell. Worst case scenario, what could happen to Paul? He could die. But you and I, we go to a friend, somebody we care about. We somehow share some portion of our faith, start up a conversation, invite somebody to a service or an event or a small group, engage in some conversation. Worst case scenario, what could happen? Well, you wouldn't die if they were a friend, you know what I mean? <laughs> but seriously, worst case scenario, they say no. They say no. Do you understand the legacy that we're a part of? We're part of a people who faced death for God, part of a people who in some parts of the world still face death for our faith, for the gospel. In fact, I, just, I got some correspondence this week. It was, came on Friday about uh, Indian Christian Mission, um, the ministry there, and the people that are associated with the ministry there. And they've gone underground because of fear for their lives, because of, of their ministry. There's a guy named Dean Troon. He was uh, communicating with everybody he could, challenging them to pray, fast and pray, tomorrow actually, on Monday, for these brothers and sisters who are risking their lives for the sake of the gospel. Like if you ask somebody, if you say, hey, why don't you come along with me next week? Next week at my church, next week, the 15th, we're having a food truck Sunday at my church. A lot of fun, a bunch of food trucks. Come to service, then we'll go and we'll eat. We're kicking off a brand new series next week. If you go to somebody, you say, hey, why don't you come with me to food truck Sunday and the new, new series? They might say no. They might. If you don't, well, they can't say yes. But you got to... Take the step. You got to step into the Jordan. Nobody can do that for you. You got to get your feet wet. You got to trust God. What do you think God would want to do in your life if you said, all right, God, let's go. I'm in. I'm yours. Make no mistake, CCC. I'm asking you to take a step, an intentional step of trust and faith in God Whatever he's asking you to do or inviting you to do or calling you to do or nudging you to do, however you get that sense of what you ought to be doing, the opportunity you have before you, 
I'm asking you to do that at this particular time and this particular season of your life. Like you might think of it this way. Psalm 76.1 says, make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Make vows to the Lord. This is a command. You ever done this before? Do you do this? Should you start doing this? Make a vow to God? Like this was a quite important part of people's spiritual lives in the Bible. In Genesis 28, Jacob made a vow to God that was a financial vow. In 1 Samuel, the first chapter, Hannah made a vow to God. It was a family vow. It was a vow she was making as a parent about her child. In Psalm 135, David makes a vow that has to do with worship. People would make very serious vows to the Lord because they understood this is how the life of faith works. You take a vow. You make a commitment. You take a step. And so I'll ask you right now to open yourself up to God and say, God, what is it you want me to do this year? What step do you want me to take? What do you want to do in my life this year? Maybe this vow will have to do with CCC, gathering like this. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 says, Don't neglect meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but you keep gathering together and encourage each other to come together and worship and learn and fellowship. And maybe for you, the step, the vow, is to put a stake in the ground and say, You know what? Unless there's something beyond my control, I get sick, you know, something, I'm going to make a vow. CCC is not a preference. It's not an option. I'm going to be here. I will commit myself to the discipline of assembly. Maybe it has to do with the Bible. You know, we're launching another round of the Bible made possible. Uh, We've done that a couple times to help people engage with the Bible because it's one of the greatest indicators of whether or not you're going to grow in your faith is daily, regular interaction with the Bible. And people are, they're confused by the Bible. They steer clear of it. It's a difficult book to understand, and we just launched this Bible Made Possible. It's all throughout. It's Tuesdays for about an hour in October, five Tuesdays, where we just say, here's how you can engage with the Bible. Several principles we give. Maybe it's real specific where you say, I need to take a vow about my thoughts or about my speech or about the first moments of my day in prayer. Maybe you don't even know. You know, we're launching this series next week. It's called At the Core. It really gets to the heart of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And maybe, maybe your vow is, I'm not going to miss a day so I can come and filter through the step that God wants me to take. But imagine this for a moment. Like, think about doing this in your life, taking a step, making a vow. But I want you to imagine for a moment about what we just read in Joshua, the third chapter. If no one... Nobody in Joshua 3 was willing to get their feet wet. Imagine everybody in that whole country saying to God, you part the water first, God. You make it safe, then we'll all get in. Where would they be? They'd be sitting on the banks of the Jordan. No promised land, no miracles, no community, no prophets, no adventure with God. Just day after day, year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, sitting on the banks of the river, waiting for something to happen. And let me tell you, some people in this room, you've been sitting on the banks of the Jordan for way too long. Some of you maybe used to get in to the river on a regular basis, but somewhere along the line, you just got comfortable sitting on the bank. And it may may feel pretty safe there, but I got to tell you, the Jordan is where God is at, where his power is, where his movement is. God's power is available to people who are willing to take the first step and trust him and take a spiritual risk. What's your step? Let's pray together. Father God, assure us, just like you did thousands of years ago, when you told Joshua to be strong, to be courageous, that you be with him, would you assure us of that right now, would you infuse us with courage, strength that comes from you, assure us of your love for us and your provision for us, we're trusting you, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Let's take a few moments and let's mark the fact that Jesus took a step, a significant step, the most cosmically impactful step there ever has been.
He stepped out of heaven. He stepped into this world, and he stepped toward the cross. There was actually even a moment with Jesus when he was in the garden the night he was betrayed uh, right before he was handed over to be crucified. He was like, God, is there another way? And he's like, you know what, though? I'm trusting you, so I'll take this step as difficult as it is. And God made a way, a wonderful way. He made a way out of the tomb. And we mark that every week when we come together. We take a little piece of bread and these individually wrapped packets of, of communion, a little piece of bread, a little bit of juice. Reminds us of Jesus' body that was given, his blood that was spilled. And he took that step to redeem us and restore us, to save us, to give us a hope and a future. So let's mark that now. If you didn't get one of those packets, you can do that in the back at those tables. And let's celebrate Jesus Christ and the ultimate step he took.